Open the pod bay doors, please, pal. All right, all right, all right. You're gonna need a bigger potion. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I break your concentration? Move to the coast. We get together, have a few laughs. <laughs> a movie eyes with Brad Patel and Gus Trap. Well, now that Jordan's not here and we just started recording and on the record, never liked that guy. <laughs> never liked him. Never liked him. We've been thinking about voting. I, I don't. Out. It's like we've been. I don't. I don't understand. This. It's been a years. Decade and a half. We think we would have yeah. figured it out sooner. Oh, oh hey, hey, man. You, what you oh, at? oh, hey, yeah. <laughs> yeah, hey, hey. Wait, does he have two? He has wireless headphones. He heard the entire thing. <laughs> <laughs> Busted. <laughs> what kind of cool beer do you have there, Jordan? Uh, I'm contractually obligated to just drink Lavery, so I uh, am. Yeah. Um. So, Adam, I, I heard I heard you're going to have a baby. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, Tonight, right? Like, yeah. And it's I mean, pretty, you know pretty quick it's, it's happening right it now. And be, like... Yeah, yeah. Tomorrow is 39 weeks, so we're in the, the could happen at any moment zone. Oh, wow. smokes. She, Our, she had a she had an appointment today. Uh, doesn't seem to be imminent. I think that we're good for the next you know couple hours. For the anyway. next couple hours, <laughs> so you can record this episode. Well, yeah, I mean, you would it, you did it. talk to her about like if it happened tonight that you would just be like just yeah, hold it, just, just hold it, miss it. I would just either hold it. it or just go do it yourself. Whatever you know, yeah. we'll have a lot of these things. Yeah. Our first uh, Bernie was born five weeks early. I don't five know if I weeks. You. Yeah. So that's very early. Yeah. So yeah. Hey, a uh, little pre-discussion one. here, and you can keep this in the podcast or what? Should we go in? Should we talk about our involvement beforehand or afterwards? Yeah, we I can just. Thinking, I was thinking up front. Just our whole experience of working on it, and how we got it, and. Yeah, I thought. And then had... as we go through it, I kind of marked, wrote well, down thought... like uh, the the stuff that we. Oh, speaking of that, where's my? Well, there's the obvious stuff we worked on. And then there's the not so obvious stuff we worked on. Well, I thought I would have you guys give like a brief introduction to the company. And now, Jordan, you remembered I, I asked you to write like something poignant about this, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I got a quote. Yeah. That's about Our- it. Well, well, <laughs> well I, got, um, I got eight pages of notes. Oh, I think wow. Lucas had seven, I think Lucas had seven pages of notes. So I have eight pages of notes. Uh, I have three, I have four. But- I don't know. I have some notes. I got some notes. Right. Uh, oh, all right. Here's the question. <laughs> Kalfi oh. looks at it. It's like either a blank page or a drawing he drew like five years ago. <laughs> Show us oh, the Andrew page. Garfield is Spider Man. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess for me, like, you know, it's just like we had like some ounce of uh, connection to this movie in the grand scheme of it all. And like, so my expectations are just like, oh God, I can't wait for this to be. And just how much I love un- uh, It Follows. It follows yeah. And uh, everything about that. I'm just like, oh, this is so cool. And it still is really cool. Like seeing our name at the end of the credits, like like not just our name in the credits, but our name. Yeah, you got a logo. Yeah, that was cool. I that this is a little bit over and above, you know. I wasn't expecting that logo at the end. So also, how good the end! Like I was like, damn, these credits are dope. Who made that drawing of uh, Andrew Garfield? Gus, was that you? As both of us. Yeah, of that was back and forth. That was the uh, really captured proof of concept right? animation. We did a couple scenes that didn't get put into the movie, but initially there was going to be a lot more animated scenes in there. Yeah, and I, I, there's less animation than I remember from the first watch. There's only like two segments. Yeah. Right. Look good. I didn't watch yeah. it in a while. I do wish he kept our, because um, the whole thing is it's like zines, to and they're you know zines are usually photocopied or like very like uh, we did this oh, whole right. like photocopy effect flicker thing with like a texture over the, like an overlay over the, all the animation. And it kind of gave it this like feel. And I, he just, he wasn't vibing on it. Oh. But. Uh, well, I guess this will all go in the episode. I guess this is the episode. Should I so like. Wait. So what movie do... are we talking about? <laughs> I don't remember. Should I do an intro? Hey gang. Welcome back to our show. Uh, my name is Brad Patello. Uh, I am joined as always by my good friend, Gus Trout. And 
Uh, we have a special episode today for a couple of reasons. First of all, we have two guests today. Uh, they are Adam Calfee and Jordan Held. And the three of you together combine like Voltron to form more frames animation. And on top of all that, you all did the animation for the movie that we're discussing today, which is Under the Silver Lake. So first of all, Adam, Jordan, welcome to the show. Thank you for- Hello. This is our Great podcast. We have a thank podcast. You. Thank you for having us. Is that the proper thing to say? This is my first podcast. I don't know the rules. That's fine. That works. Yeah. I Second for me, I believe. Gus and I were on film the film series, North, Northwest Pennsylvania Film Series podcast, Once Upon a Time, but- so, um, so briefly, give us like a rundown the history of more frames animation, like what kind of work oh, wow. you do, and just I don't know, just this. Tell us about your studio. Well, guys, I'll give it up to one of you guys, Calfi. You go. Uh, dang it. <laughs> um, all right. Well, first off, you're sort of the you're like the uh, the original seed. I'm I'm older I'm older than you two by a bit, so that makes me the yeah. boss. <laughs> boss Adam. <laughs> uh, well, you've been around since the beginning, Brad, because you taught yes. us while we were students at was... Edinburgh, where we met. Yes. So many moons ago, I figured out the timeline recently. I wish I I don't know if I still have it written down here because I did. Uh, that must have been well, interesting. Were you like, did you have like a cork board with like fucking string up and like yeah, basically, basically, straws? Yeah. But um, you guys graduated the following year, right? 2008. I graduated in 2007. We sort of teamed up more officially in 2009. Yeah. yeah. Uncle Howie and uh, Wars My we, Destiny. We did Wars My Destiny and Uncle Howie, what? My yeah. uncle for Ill Bill. Yeah. Those were music videos. Those were 2000 nine and ten and they then, have over a million views on youtube <laughs> and then that was when moon boy got picked up by vimeo and then that opened the floodgates that sounds so, about right yeah. okay so briefly after we banded together initially at edinburgh we started working together after everybody graduated we got lucky with a series of uh music videos and by having the Moon Boy short film picked up and featured by Vimeo, which gave us a lot of exposure. And we've been riding that wave for <laughs> how long oh, wow. now? Yeah. 13 yeah. years? Yeah, we found that level and we've just been trying to keep it, you know? That's right. <laughs> That's you gotta maintain. Our yeah, maintain, yeah. You, you, so you've been a studio since 2009-ish and... Um, 2009-ish and we're located good. in... Erie, Pennsylvania, right? Which is just above Edinburgh. So we accept interns from Edinburgh, which I think leads us to Milo Newman. Right, who, who was an intern. Then leads us to Under the Silver Lake. So that's the through line. Very nice. Where we ended up on this. Yeah, Milo project. was just like, like the level, le where he was at in school, you know what? So we, we were like five or seven years ahead of him. It, like, at least yeah you know and he just he is just like incredible absolutely incredible yeah, he's good yeah one day he came he came to us he's like hey i uh th this guy I, i'm working with this uh on this movie and they want some animation do you guys want to do it it's the guy who did uh this movie called it follows i've never seen it but <laughs> we're like uh, <laughs> like whoa whoa whoa, whoa. Like whoa. <laughs> 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 what, what? <laughs> He got that because he was doing storyboards at the time. Does that sound right? Right. Yeah, I believe so. So what was Milo's involvement? He drew the he comic. He drew the zines that are featured in the movie. Yeah, so the physical comic that Andrew Garfield like is like obsessed with when he goes to that bookstore and keeps like picking those zines up are Milo's, you know, his credit drawn the, by hand. His credit um, at the end says graphic artist. That's the credit yeah. they gave him. Yeah. I wasn't sure what that meant. I know you said he drew the zine. So in the movie, Andrew Garfield has like a comic book, like an indie published illustrated a, magazine. Right. And so we got yeah, to see like, that prop, right? You don't get to see all the pages of it, but you know. And then your yeah. animation is based on the, that artwork. 
basically. Correct. It's, uh, it, it expands on that artwork, trying to stay in the same style. And then also we animated a lot of his actual artwork from the zine. And a lot of the stuff that's in the end credits is stuff from the zine that wasn't otherwise seen that we then just animated either, you know, made it boil or made it move a little bit. Right. So when we, and also when we, when we were first approached, we were asked to do like a proof of concept, which in my opinion, which there is a shot from that in the movie with the dog uh, killer holding up the little like chihuahua. I remember that. I remember you guys. Yeah. I remember that's you showing from me their that original shot. Christmas concept. Our and our uh, our our friend and colleague Jeremy animated that shot. Yeah, if I'm remembering correctly. Yeah, that's true. Good call. So but, it was uh, After Effects, right? It, yeah, yeah, Photoshop and After Effects, and um, so we basically had like a weekend to figure it out, and we like I think in like less than a day. I think we met around. It was like on a Saturday at like after lunch. We were like you like rounded us up, you saw the email and you're like, Hey, I got a call or whatever it was, Kelpy. And by the end, by that night, we had like an animatic that we sent off. And then we, then we had to come up with like how we were going to do it, which was a lot of boils and puppet stuff. And that first piece, I mean, it's, it's so much cooler than it sucks that it's not in the movie. And I don't know how it would have fit in the movie. It may be a dream sequence, but, um, so you did yeah, animation. Okay, I would like to show cut. that. Well, but you we see some of it in the yeah. credits. Yeah, Andrew Garfield's kind of like, anytime you see a fully animated Andrew Garfield, that's from the beginning. All the stuff with the uh, the hanging dogs, and there's a shot that's in a graveyard with a bunch of dog tombstones going past. Yeah. All that was part of an original sequence that got cut. But I'm glad we got to put it some of it in the credits anyway, because I was happy with a lot of that. Yeah, that was a that was a good call on your part too. Um, the credits so, are cool. So you got the, some artistic say on what the credits were? All of that, every letter in the credits is my handwriting. I had to custom create custom fonts to do all the, the credits with. So that was a whole, another aspect of this that was, you know, time consuming, but fun. What you, what we, actually did that is in the movie is the very beginning you see a um a unicorn a tiger a snake and a lion we designed all of those which that again that's a, that's a small clue right there under the silver lake you unicorn t lion t lion wait or no t t, t tiger T Tiger, T T Lion is my uh, my rap name. Oh yeah, sorry, I forgot. That's right, <laughs> Texas Lion. That's right. Um, so we did that. We did the two animated se segments, and we did the end credits. But what you don't see, a bunch of the movie wasn't uh, it, like there was reshoots or uh, unfilmed segments, and they were waiting to get Andrew Garfield in. So in the meantime we took the style from the comic, from the zines and made storyboards and animatics for like multiple, like, you know, minutes and minutes of animation. Uh, or, uh, Is that what was show, what, it was shown in can like can, that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah they, they wanted to get, they wanted it to be in can. So film festival, so they needed a complete film or like some form of a complete film. You can tell the reshoots too, because Andrew Garfield's like his hair and his hair is different. Yeah. So you can pick them out. So right, it's the, um, he did cut it after can, right? There were edits that took place after the film festival. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. So that was what started the long series of delays. This film is infamous for, for how long the, the studio delayed it. Oh yeah. Uh, so it came out in what, 2018, 2019. I think it's 2019. I, I think uh, Corrections Corner already, you did say 2018. Yeah, I thought it was 2019 <laughs> as well. Well, it depends, it's officially 2019. It depends where you look. Like, so, it was delayed endlessly by it, 24. De delayed forever, and then finally came out when it came out. Now, part of that was because the studio wanted him to cut like 40 minutes out of it, and he wasn't willing to budge. So then they did all the reshoots during that time, replacing all of our animation and animatic work 
with the, the reshoots. But we basically, we boarded those sequence and, I, and I'm like shocked at how true to our storyboards and animatics, the film stuff ended up being, yeah. which is really cool in its own right. So your, the boards you drew were always intended to be temporary? Correct. I think it was, it was sort of, uh, we were testing the waters. Because he thought that originally, I think the thought was it would be cool to have it turn into animation here and there as just another layer of, um, you know, surrealness about Being, him sort yeah. of losing his grip on reality and what is he being influenced from, you know, reading the zine and what is real life. And he kind of had a, a bigger idea about how to incorporate it throughout, which I think fell by the way. So, somewhere along the line. I'm not sure. I, th I don't think the studio liked it as much. So It Follows is 2014. 2014, 2015? Who's the fact guy on the podcast? Well, that's me. Well, yeah. I the internet sells us different things. I mean, the internet says Under the Silver I'm Lake is 2018, and sometimes it says 2019. I'm but... seeing 2014 for It Follows. So yeah, 2014, It Follows, real low budget, real kind of surprise hit. Personally, one of my favorite horror films of the 2010s, maybe ever. Yeah, it's very good. Yeah. Made, a, made a lot of money because they didn't spend much money on it, and uh, somebody... They were like, here, make make another movie. And that was under the Silver Lake, right? Well, yeah. And I, man, this fucking disaster pieces score for uh, It Follows is so goddamn good. I've been a fan of his since uh, Fez, which is a really cool video game. And uh, to know that he was like attached to Under the Silver Lake, I was so fucking hyped. And I do like the score, but. It's not like I was like, oh, it's gonna be like eight bitty video game, which it there is moments like that uh, twice when he comes to that cave. Uh, here he's in the cave and he actually comes to like the uh, entrance way to the sure. shelter, and whenever he's um, kind of figuring out the the Zelda map and the like cereal box map like line up and whatever, up. yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. That's His tone so, well, is kind of like that too. Yeah. But now we started it. I just looked it up in the email. We started working on this in February and March of 2017. Wow. Yeah. That was, it was, it was like, man, when is this movie going to come out? And it's like, it it's was like, forever. well, then it was like, I'm waking up in like a cold sweat at night thinking like he's just there. I've already told all these people that we were in this movie and they're going to cut all of our stuff. And then to see the trailer and our shit is in the trailer. How cool is that? Well, so they screened it at Cannes and it got kind of a tepid reception, right? And A24 kind of... kind of thing. Well, that's the reaction. Kind of you look on the internet and that's, that's what the reaction is. People either love it or they hate it. And there's no middle ground. Usually, I think that's a good sign. Like whenever I see that, if I'm looking on like Rotten Tomatoes or something and I see people either loved or hated something... I'm in, you know, because at least it's going to be interesting. Yeah. But, um, but it definitely so, has some legs, I think, after well, a second viewing, especially. So I, I, uh, I, after this most recent viewing, I got on and, and looked up what all the codes were because I wasn't going to waste my time deciphering them myself. So I wanted to see what they were. And so that led right. me to the Reddit page, which is still currently very active. There were like three new videos that were posted and made this week wondering aloud about who the owl's kiss is or this or that so it's yeah. still people are still discovering it and still you know pulling on the threads and trying to figure it out which to me indicates that i think we've got a sleeper cult classic here and i think, I think it'll just pick up steam as the years go by you know i think it's already being called a cult hit, like because i think it has a cult following now because of the reddit thread yeah, I remember finding the Reddit thread like a while ago and being like, holy shit, guys, like, check this out. And uh, <laughs> well, oh, Gus, did you I, do you did like kind of a deep dive into some of the fan theories, right? Or Well, there's yeah, there's a really long somebody on YouTube did a really long video. That's really good. And I don't remember what it is. And maybe we'll link it later on our cool website. We don't have. But uh, <laughs> um yeah, it just it was like 45 minutes long of this guy just going into like every single part that has been decoded 
and he's using the Reddit thing. So basically just check out the Reddit thing. So the but, video just summarizes yeah. everything that's in the Reddit thread. It, it's insane. I mean, it, so the, the beginning of the movie is a code with the, the three or the four animals. So it's already setting you up. And then in the, as it's tracking through all the people in the coffee shop, there's a kid with a shirt on that has all these animals, which yeah. furthers the code, which that shirt just says like, aware of the uh, dog killer. Dog killer. And then on the chalkboard above, like the menu board of the coffee shop, it has Morse, Morse code, which then leads to something else. And it just keeps on going, but nothing is, from my understanding, and maybe you can correct me here, Kalfi, but like nothing is like a groundbreaking tie-in to necessarily anything, right? It's just like, of- in terms of understanding the movie, no. Yeah. Man, they're just kind of fun games layered in there. Uh, just exactly to get the audience to, you know, obsess about it and start pulling on the threads, just like the character Sam is doing in in the film. Right. So I think it's just fun to revisit and try to figure out and to play with, but I, I don't think-, think it actually affects the understanding of of the movie. Do you think there's some element of trolling to that, like where David Robert Mitchell was like? I'm just gonna troll. I'm just gonna throw a bunch of stuff in here to to, <laughs> to get people to think it's super deep or something. Or I well, I don't think anything. And the reason I think he didn't like he was like I am not cutting this movie is because everything is there or it's every there's nothing that's not supposed to be there. And if you take one thing out, like the whole thing is fucked up, right? Why would he be so stringent about? not cutting uh like it's how long is this movie it's almost like three hours long right? like 220 yeah yeah something like that so yeah they wanted him to cut it after can after it got a tepid reception at can i just don't think why he why would he be I, I just think everything is there like for a reason well you'd have to cut out entire threads yeah you, know? you couldn't just cut out bits because like all the bits lead to some other bit you know so you have to take all of those bits out i think like there, there's two things being uh, there in the movie there's all these different there's the zine guy who's obsessed with all these crazy conspiracies andrew garfield has his own thing with his uh wheel of fortune thing going on and then his deep dive into the la rich people conspiracies but at some point the he, he's at that underground bar and that one girl when he's asking about the meaning of the uh jesus and the whatever Brides of Dracula. Yeah, Brides of Dracula. It's like, she's like, nothing matters. Like, what the fuck are you doing? That's so stupid. Like, don't be an idiot. Don't look at, he's also saying like, don't look into this movie, even though he's taking the time and putting all of that shit in there. She's got such a good line in there that he's talking to the balloon girl, right? Yeah. And she says, this was one of the lines that uh, Chelsea wrote down for me. So they're having a drink there on the Jane, Jane Mansfield gravestone. Uh, the underground like the mausoleum club or whatever yeah and he's saying that you know, jesus from the band jesus and the brides of dracula has hidden a secret message in the song and she's like jesus wouldn't hide a message in a message which is like such a good line and also like so uh to me in the movie he's finding all these secret messages hidden in things a lot of them are are nothing right there are things you can it's in that way it's trolling right because they don't lead to anything yeah. What, what I mean by trolling is that, like, the whole point of the movie seems to be that looking for meaning is stupid. Yeah. Just enjoy the time. I, you know. but, so I, I, but he puts all this stuff in there to invite you to try to find meaning in. Yeah. So I, I went into it also specifically, but not to, you know, derail. If, they, if we're even on a rail, I'm not even sure we are. But uh, <laughs> I wanted to watch the movie again and view it through the eyes of QAnon because I've been listening to all the QAnon uh, yeah. <laughs> podcasts. I don't know if anybody recommend podcast recommendation here, QAnon Anonymous. Check it out. It's very good. It's very but good. It's, uh, it's interesting because there's a lot of this happening in real life. Disaffected 30-somethings trying to find meaning in things on the internet which <laughs> don't have meaning and then being drawn deeper into this you know, made-up fake conspiracy 
and being led into doing violence Same stuff, violence yeah. and yeah, crazy <laughs> stuff so i thought of sheer just stupidity i thought the uh, i thought the same thing when i was watching it i was like well i guess andrew garfield could be like doing this with QAnon, so this might actually be better uh yeah yeah than that right. alternative rather that yeah yeah well, the whole thing like... at the end of the movie is that it turns out he's right there really is a vast dumb conspiracy <laughs> of like clues hidden in pop culture ephemera well this is also a classic uh movie odyssey um thing we do here where we talk about the ending right away and since you already brought that up <laughs> i wrote down this everything is true uh, his confession about whenever he's like the 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 hobo or the homeless king is like basically saying like like you're the dog killer right he's like who why do you have these treats right he knows the answer he just wants to hear it from him but but Andrew Garfield's confession is true his girlfriend ha it's like his through the movie logic you know when somebody says something in a movie it's like you just have to take it as like you know like the captain of like some spaceship is like there's no life on this planet or something it's just well then there's no life on the planet you know what i mean I, it's like his confession about like that he missed his girlfriend and he was upset he's not saying he's the dog killer but he is saying he's the dog killer uh okay, two things real quick do you think we should try and summarize the plot of this i didn't yeah, it's, it's hard to we will <laughs> okay so the, <laughs> we yeah can, we got to that <laughs> i was just gonna say that uh Everything, is, goes everything is true. Oh, Gus always does this. Wait, Gus always does it. I blame you. <laughs> <laughs> Under the Silver Lake is a movie. Uh, Andrew Garfield uh, plays a character who's... Well, how do you guys feel about this character, first of all? I, I mean, is that a first of all thing? I think he's... Uh, I. He's our hero, obviously, but he's not very likable. And right. I think he's, he's, he's an a, ass. He's a liar and he physically assaults people and he, uh, you know, he, he, he's a creep. So I, I wrote down like several things he does in the first 20 minutes of the movie that make me hate him. He's like chain smoking on his deck while he spies on his neighbors with <laughs> binoculars, yeah. binoculars and his like neighbor lady, the bird lady is like, can, like always topless. So he's always like, leering at her he beats up some kids yep because they scratched his car he like beats the <laughs> shit out of them oh <laughs> yeah yeah and he assaults jesus in the bathroom pretty brutally yeah so i don't All know what to make to of this anger, I, I think the, in the dog we're movie. following this character through the whole movie like he's in almost every shot and he's such a loathsome character that it's hard. I, guess, I can see people not connecting with this movie because it's like, I hate this person. You know, this, why are we, why do we I, care what happens? To he's you? a total loser, sad boy. Yeah. yeah. Like, I don't have you know that, what I mean? Just, um, I know what you guys are saying, I guess, but I, I like enjoy, like, Steve Zizu is a piece of shit, but he's fun to be around. Like, Russ Cole is like, who wants, like, he's fun to watch. You don't want to be around this person or you wouldn't want to be like connected with this person, but it's fun to watch. And I think Andrew Garfield adds like what he is, what was maybe on the page of the script to what he is doing. He's very like how he's like leaves a room or something. When he leaves a room after the do uh, the Hobo King lets him go, he like wanders out of there all weird and stuff. I'm thinking like, he like all uh, of these weird moves. When he's when he's creeping up on the girls after they leave Sarah's apartment with the box and he follows them to the paddle boat and he's running across the lawn to hide behind the tree and peer around the corner. Yes, ex yes, it's I love very that. comedic physical acting. I yes. think he brings a lot to the performance. And in that regard, it's fun. And thank God it is because <laughs> right, right. if you had a character that's that sort of unappealing <laughs> and then the actor sucked also on top of it. He's got a lot of good takes. He's given a lot of good face in this movie. He's got a lot of good oh. like understated like takes. Also, um, fun fact, uh, only 5'10", Andrew Garfield. He's only 5'10". I thought oh, he was he, tall. Yeah, he seems oh, so a fun like fact. Him. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. Like when you're under six foot, you're just obsessed with how tall other guys are all the time. Or at least it's just me. I don't know. <laughs> five ten. He's five uh, ten. He 
Yeah, I wrote down like great Andrew Garfield faces. He's having uh, him, him and, and the lovely actress uh, Ricky Lindholm are having a moment and he's telling her about how he knows Kurt Cobain's daughter and he just had recently had that poster signed. That's, that's like one of the first things he says. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, that scene is so awkward, that sex scene. Oh, it's, it's like it's 10 very, minutes in. Hard to watch. <laughs> Yeah, and like he's watching female tennis. Well, we also established too that he kind of um, objectifies women. Yes, and he's the, the male gaze is extremely like Ooh, I have that written down. Yeah. Uh, male gaze on here. Male gaze. There's actually a they there's a woman at the first party sequence he goes to with the balloon girl, and she's just like reading poetry or something, or mm -hmm. and she says she's in her whatever she's reading from. She mentions the male gaze. So we spend the next first 20 minutes or so just with this character. Yeah, a but woman I think that moves in. Okay, yeah, there, there we go. That's what I'm looking That's for. kind of the inciting incident is like a woman, we see some, a new woman at the pool and he kind of goes to her apartment and they they kind of flirt a little bit and she says, well, come on, come over tomorrow. And then she disappears. Like that night, she just moves out. And her apartment's empty the next day. And so he basically the spends the rest of the movie searching for her and in doing so uncovers this ridiculous conspiracy. So he goes to visit the, uh, the author of the magazine and he's even more of a conspiracy theorist. He followed, like when he goes to the woman's Sarah's apartment the next day, a woman, uh, Played by that's the girl from Girls. Yeah, it's Shoshana. Shoshana from Girls. Yeah. <laughs> I love I don't that know. Brad knows Girls. I like, don't know yeah. her name. Her act. Yeah, she was so, also in the flight attendant uh, recently. Ah, yeah. So Shoshana from Lawyer Girls friend. picks up a box and he he kind of follows her in a Volkswagen. And there's a nice, actually, really well shot sort of chase scene. I guess you would call it with like Bernard Herrmann style score to it it's straight out of a hitchcock film there's a lot of hitchcock references in this movie all right yeah the rest of the movie is like he tries to track her down he's getting he's falling deeper into the rabbit hole yeah one I mean, thing leads to another and there's a bunch of different side conspiracies as well but he's just literally just following along thing after thing as they come to him and there's, I think, I think it's illustrated well in the movie by like, like the following a coyote or whatever. It, it's like he's at a dead end, and then he sees a coyote, and he literally follows it, and then that's the next step in the conspiracy theory hunt. He's right. just finding connections that don't exist; they're just meaningless. But then he's making all these weird connections. But then the twist to Rue is that some of this conspiracy stuff is grounded in you know the reality of the film this is actually happening well yeah right. we get to two hours later where he discovers that there's some weird death cult that that's where sarah went he's one of the brides the three brides of this death cultist who gets in entombed under the silver lake basically it's like the right. pharaohs so that's that's the whole movie <laughs> <laughs> But all this other stuff, you know, like all these plots, like these well, side I would plots like and... to. I think that this is like, we've kind of been talking about this a bit, but this is a movie you need to watch more than you can't just watch this once or twice. This is like multiple viewings. And I think each time personally it has gotten better for me that you have certain expectations when you first roll in and nothing's really met it goes all over the place there's great moments but it's just like all right th that was pretty cool but it doesn't like it doesn't you don't leave going like like with a sigh of relief or like a yes you're like wait what the fuck no stop like i there is this like history of these like west coast meandering <laughs> mystery movies like Inherent Vice or Mulholland Drive or Big Lebowski, where the character is kind of set up to find X and goes on this journey and meets these characters and then sort of gets to the end, but like, eh, you know what I mean? Well, I, think, I, I think that's such an allegory, an easy allegory for going to Hollywood. Uh -huh, because, yeah. and, and they talk about it whenever the scene with uh, him and his buddy played by Topher Grace 
are talking about how everybody is like this surveillance state while they're flying a drone to spy on some girl. Hey, right. no, this is funny, you know. And she's uh, crying too. Irony level. It's having a bad yeah. day. But they, they changed, we actually uh, started that sequence. Too. Yeah, we started um, that sequence. They changed that the actress. They got a new actress for that scene. It was a blonde in the yeah. footage they sent us. And uh, he says, Topher Grace, uh, oh, no, maybe this is when they're playing Mario. He says something about, uh, you know, there's a whole generation of like disaffected 30 somethings with a hero complex who, you know, are looking for mystery because there is none left. And right. it's just describing Sam, discussion? but yeah. Just, yes, yeah. describing yeah, totally. Sam Also, to the did you notice that they were playing a level, an underground level? Underwater so level. It took my it took my fourth viewing or whatever, but that was one of the big revelations I had. I was like, yeah, oh my yeah. god! In the Mario footage, he literally goes into an underground bunker. Now, here's something that I didn't notice until this time around. And it's under but it's underwater level. Under when they're in the when the homeless king leads him down into the bunker, he crawls through. He finds that it's under construction or whatever the bunker to be. There's Mario pipes coming yeah. through the ceiling. So to me, in the in the, that's when he sits it, down and he says it's a fucking bomb shelter. Yes, and but so within the logic of the film, though, that validates the idea that the elites really are hiding the secret messages in the pop culture, right? Because with the cereal box overlay that fits into the Zelda map and the Nintendo Power magazine, I have a hard time. Like, am I supposed to believe that this this is what's really going on? Because there's some dream state stuff in this film too he's he's hounded by those shadow guys in that one sequence he sees the dog killer in that one sequence and let's talk about the owl's kiss is she real or is she in everybody's heads is he the owl's kiss that's mm. another theory that he kills the comic zine author so yeah. what's real what's not yeah the because because i would also say like right at the beginning there's like you don't know it's a dream sequence and you obviously know it's a dream sequence, right? And then they're very like on the nose dream sequences. But towards the end, whenever he's he's like naked running around his apartment and he's taking the Zelda map and he's putting the things together and he's like, oh, oh. And it's like just all falling together. So, but how it's shot and how he's acting and everything, it's almost like it's just happening so perfectly it it seems like at that moment he's like really lo fucking losing it <laughs> like but again well, there's a part of me is like everything is real about the movie like there's nothing why would you have i think a kind of like peak acting point in the movie is whenever he's after the owl's kiss animation bit and he's in the tub and he's like telling his theory about yeah oh i just that moment where he's like oh is that i'm sorry does that weird. sound weird yeah, like it. that to me in his writing head that's david in that scene like just spilling out onto the page him going like what the fuck is going on up there and like his deepest desires of what possibly could be happening yeah what so point I, does he get sprayed by a skunk too because that's a big thing that he stinks through the whole movie because he gets sprayed by a skunk right I'm really? super glad you I'm super glad you brought that up because that's my biggest unanswered piece. I know as silly as that sounds, but there's the subplot of everyone thinks he stinks. Yeah. Until the final scene when he hooks up with the, the old hippie washed up actress bird lady across the street, she thinks mm. he smells like patchouli. It's not so that the, far off. Yeah, well. <laughs> It's pretty on the nose. That's the same for this. Is, yeah, so that's that's a different podcast. We can have uh, well that conversation. I that's... but it seems to me like it must represent something, but I'm not quite sure what. Yeah, well, th there's a whole thing with the homeless, and he's basically almost homeless. He is homeless by the end of the movie. He yeah, becomes he... homeless in, in the final scene. Yeah, right. Rex <laughs> Lynn kicks him out of his apartment. Um, and he has that diatribe against the homeless. I know this isn't right yeah. for me to say, but I hate the homeless. And then he describes himself. They're, they're liars. They're bullies. They stand around on the edges and never actually mix in. They just watch. And <laughs> yeah. he, he's just talking about himself. And he's, so he's, you know, I guess hating himself there. 
And then the big final moment is him, he becomes homeless. That's like, you know, the the big reveal at the end or whatever. Right, well, because not only, yeah, and there's the hobo code on his wall about like, what I think that's like not safe here. Stay quiet. Keep, stay keep quiet. Keep silent, yeah, stay, keep silent. stay quiet. So, hey, okay, let's go to the squirrel. I want to hear your thing on the squirrel, man. Yeah, tell us about your squirrel theory. Let's okay. hear it. Okay. Squirrel. This is gonna. Squirrel. This is gonna lead to uh, connect to a bunch of different um, places, but oh, I'll just give you. I'll give. Well, this, that's the whole movie, right? Yeah. Is it connects yeah, yeah, to a yeah. bunch of different places. All the red string crisscrossing, left and right. So, uh, well, this is. How about this? I'll just walk through the way my brain made these connections last night while I was lying awake in the middle of the night thinking about <laughs> this movie. Hell yeah! In preparation for today. intervention. Intervention. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it occurred to me what the parrot is saying. So that's sort of like one of the last big mysteries is what is mm. the parrot saying? And the characters don't know what the parrot's saying, but, and here's where he's real tricky for using a silent film. But so Sam's mother sends him that silent film on VHS that he's watching at the end. Right. He's getting his maternal love via movies which i think is important yeah that the, the he's got such an investment she's got such an investment him and his mother in in old hollywood and uh and i think also that um ricky lindholm's character his friend with benefits character she shows up twice once as what could be a milkmaid once as a nurse so she's got a, a kind of a maternal a weird maternal type of role as well even though you know there's also <laughs> The with benefits part, which hopefully is not too right. maternal. But, <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah. So all of that, all of that. So we're seeing the silent film and he's really invested in it, right? He's like almost starting to cry when the actress in the silent film says, never look down, always look up. Yeah. Right? The bird saying, look up. It says it every other time. So there's one that just is like, Rawr. And then look up, yeah. look up. Yeah. And so I'm pretty sure that's what it is. And because he smiles, it, it, it says it and he does like a recognition to the bird. So that leads to me now describing all the many times that looking up is used symbolically in this movie, mm. including the last Girl. scene where he's standing on that balcony looking up into his apartment mm -hmm. and the landlord looks up onto the wall and sees the signal. Now, but now I sound like a conspiracy theorist going through <laughs> this, yeah. which is exactly what the point is of the movie. That's a good, it's a fun Rubik's cube. It's a Rubik's cube that's been altered so that it never actually finishes, clicks into place. You can't, yeah. but you can still play with it for days, you know? You're so, blowing my mind. <laughs> yeah. I, he, he looks up literally to james dean when he goes to the observatory and has to rub his head right yeah and then he's got a james dean thing going on in that last shot too i think it's way he's smoking the cigarette whatever but that's uh it's the whole sort of point is idol worship right so when he's in the tent talking to the guy who we don't actually know what what his old deal is but the millionaire who's about to go to the tomb so that right. him with his three brides he's talking about how they're going to ascend so he's looking up they're going to ascend into the heavens and, and escape this mortal coil or whatever it is so he's got something that he's aspiring to right then there's the whole looking up to the hollywood sign there's you know the um pursuit of celebrity which is looking up toward you know towards mm. these actors these famous people right and then there's this squirrel, this base animal. This is how we begin. That throws itself off a tree to kill itself in front of this guy who's sort of a scummy guy. And, and then the squirrel is looking up at him in its last moment. So it's just sort of like a never ending turtles on turtles on turtles, people looking up towards whatever the next echelon yeah. is but he uh, in some sense he meets what he would consider his god 
the songwriter. Yes. And he and fucking awesome. And, and the first time we see him at the coffee shop, beware the dog killer is on the window, but it's backwards. Dog backwards, God killer. He kills his own yeah. God, the guy who created every pop song uh-huh. since the classical music theory or whatever. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, even the I, zine, the zine woo! author guy. Yeah, the doc- let's just, we'll let's end it right there. <laughs> I, think, I think that's the end of the episode right there. So, <laughs> and cut. So uh, let's get into the, um, let's get into. Uh, I did write down Idle Tree too. Like that, nice. I, like when uh, at the beginning, when the two of them are making love and he's got the Kurt Cobain poster and they're both looking up at it. And she yeah. said, I love Kurt Cobain. And, there's this there's this whole theme running through it of idols and yeah how and like you just and like you just said though looking up to it right there's just a whole lot of of that I was thinking about even when like the scene where he's climbing out of the bunker right he's climbing through that tunnel up towards the light it's all very symbolic yeah, which we did storyboard so can I can I real quick if uh, I found this out on on the Reddit uh, so yeah. I can't take credit for it but. Um, the fireworks that they see in the sky after Sam and Sarah have their little night flirting together. Yeah. Are Moore's code. Oh. And they're looking up at them too. And they're looking up as at one them. does. I will and, toot my horn real here, real quick here. The first viewing, when those fireworks are going off, the girl is like, there's us, like she is. Her face, red. You, can, yeah. you can tell that that's meaningful to her right. in some way. Uh, I, I took it as a signal that she knew about, but it turned right, out like, it's, it's more than that. It's Morse code. And uh, he said, Sam says, Andrew Garfield says something right, like so soon, which is sort of a weird way to put it. Like so early in the night or so soon before July 4th, we don't know. Uh, you know what the date is. Or is he a little bit late for the summer or something? Yeah, a little yeah. late. Yeah, right, right. But uh, okay, so it says, I have ascended. Oh, whoa. In Morse code. And the the uh, it, within the fiction of the film, that's a clue to her that they're about to go into the bunker. Right. So they're headed in. So that's like you know that's her last night. That, that's something. Uh, right. Another right. fun that's fact crazy. here. Uh, this is my role in the podcast. So uh, uh, Riley Co. I think I don't know how to pronounce her last name correctly. Elvis's granddaughter. Elvis's granddaughter. What is it? Hey, I got one for you, fun fact, Jordan. Speaking of idols. Pop up podcast. After um (laughs) after he beats up the kids, and I want to get into like that scene and the significance of that scene, because I think it's there's wait, are we are we implying that I've beat up a kid? Well, no. I mean, I know I have that that bird thing, but yeah, that's not. That, that's we don't not think it's the, the beware of <laughs> yeah, the well, bird killer yeah, over well, here. Well, yeah, um, <laughs> it had to be done. Uh, they, well, so he has the sticky hand from the gum on the uh, handle, right? Oh yeah, and, and he's got he, a Spider-Man comic. Yes, which is that is just the the Spider-Man like issue one thing is hilarious, just because. And he like shakes it off violently. Like, yeah. Get this role away from me. I'm, exactly. Yeah. I'm done I, playing what Spider-Man. A, what a great little... Uh, I don't know, answer. Brad. I don't know if he's done playing Spider-Man. Yeah, apparently he's on the way back. Photos would, set photos would maybe disagree. I don't know. So what, yeah, what do you think? The, I think the importance of him beating up the kid is to show that he has this like crazy rage side to him, which then would tie into the him being the dog killer. A lot, of, a lot of people are reading the character to be kind of on the verge of a nervous breakdown like right like his whole performance being like a metaphor for mental illness kind of huh i so i I see it like i I can see the you know barely constrained rage thing but also i i'm viewing that through again the lens of sort of the current situation with the disaffected 30 somethings the the QAnon movement again to bring it back to that but uh I, i so there's the one reading where he loses control, like a Jekyll and Hyde thing, which he's got Jekyll and Hyde on his wall, poster of it on his wall in his apartment. Did you guys catch on that? With, no. He's got all the movie he's monsters. He's got a lot of cr- classic movie monster posters. Right, right, right. He is a monster. The mummy. Um, yeah. Uh, are we trying to get at the point that DRM is uh, actual actually Q? Well, Whoa. you heard it here first. <laughs> Whoa. 
Big if true. Big I'm only on true. episode three of the HBO documentary, so no spoilers. Um, so the Jesus and the Brides of Dracula, what were in, in the movie, they're saying we were going to be called Jesus and the Brides of Frankenstein, right? But then right. it was Jesus and the Brides of Dracula. Jesus famously entombed. Dracula famously entombed. It's one of the Just things saying. he's known for. <laughs> One of the things he's known for, super known for, <laughs> and leading season. into this Easter season, we should at least acknowledge. Uh, that. Well, do you remember, uh, like in Pulp Fiction, we were talking about quest for meaning? I think this comes back here. Like, this character is um, searching for meaning, and kind of the whole thing's a metaphor for just. He has no purpose, so he's just making some bullshit up. <laughs> yeah, finding purpose, finding meaning in pop culture ephemera. Yeah, that's the old. That's what I thought the whole time I was watching this the second time. Just like this dude, just making up everything he sees is so important until he gets over it, and then he thinks of the next thing, and then moves on to that, and then yeah. he eventually does get somewhere, which I guess is you know. But and then the fact that he's actually right is kind of almost right. incidental it's about the yeah yeah it's about the yeah. it's about getting there so let me uh if you have done the research on by research i mean go to the reddit uh page and see <laughs> yeah. what all the all the all the codes mean um the the ultimate goal of the you know scavenger hunt with the codes leads you to basically a coordinates next to a mountain that's called Mitchell Peak, which uh -huh. is then the idea being that that's where DRM's uh, tomb is going to be. You know, it's just kind of a joke. It's just a gag. All the codes in there, right? That's so the, really uh, something. There's a, a ticker at the bottom of the TV. Uh, the news is playing that, uh, what's the character's name? Sevenson or whatever is dead. The rich guy in the- Yeah, sure. Center. And it says something about, I don't know if it's Calliope or Calliope, but it's a type of cipher. And then there's graffiti on the walls of a tunnel and on the bathroom uh, stall wall in a shot that's written in that Calliope or Calliope cipher. Yeah, that cipher is like says, kind of a new thing they just figured out, right? The guy who cracked it is a computer programmer. He wrote a computer program that cracked it. It's from like... I don't know, they found it's from the 1800s or something. They found yeah. it's a, a Some hundred and text something that, page. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But so they finally cracked it. This guy also was one of the guys that uh, worked on the Zodiac cipher. Um, he was a consultant on the film. Oh, okay. So he d put this stuff in there. He, you know, he, I guess he's that guy, the go to guy for this kind of thing. So the Calliope ciphers on the bathroom stall wall and on the graffiti say coffee menu. And you look at the coffee menu in the coffee house and it's got morse code along the bottom right right and it says uh oh i i might get this wrong i'm not sure but it i think it's it's that's the one that's the step that says what three words so now the hobo code that means do not enter is the three slash lines yeah is the same symbol as a logo for a company called what three words.com and the one three words is a program that gives it's basically it's mapped the whole world in three meter by three meter segments. And then it's assigned three English language words to every three by three meter segment in the world. So uh -huh. you put in three seemingly <laughs> random words, it'll point you to a direct spot, right? So then you notice when she's watching How to Marry a Millionaire, they've got the Marilyn Monroe and the uh, Lucy Bacall or whatever, yeah. the dolls, and there's the code right yeah, underneath, underneath their the, names. Yeah, underneath the dolls, yeah. That's in Zodiac Cipher. That Zodiac Cipher translates to uh, Tombstone Sheriff Entries, which if you then go enter in the what3words.com, oh, yeah, okay. points you to Mitchell Peak, which is him just saying this is where my tomb is going to be i think is like, what's up yeah and yeah. then i forgot one one of the steps is okay they misspelled what three words it says what threat words right with one e instead of two in the word three but 
then the billboard that we made that I can oh, see. Oh yeah, the billboard. Now. Yeah, we made the billboard. Yeah, In the oh, bottom yeah. of the billboard, the bottom co corner, it says E equals E E. So that uh, solves uh, that right. code. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's the billboard with the, his ex girlfriend's face, or it's the hamburger yeah. one. The yeah. hamburger one. Both. Well, well, yeah, it's the same billboard. The um. Uh, but he's it's plastered over like in the yeah. end of the movie yeah. you see they're replacing it with the yeah what does it say hamburgers are love or something yeah yeah, yeah. so yeah. it used to say uh i can see clearly and now it says i can see hamburgers are love <laughs> yeah. uh well, that's your artwork that clown that ronald mcdonald yeah, that, right on, on both both billboards okay but uh yeah one of the criticisms people have about this movie is that it's sexist but mm. You I mean, know, it's so intentional. How could you not see? Well, that? Th this is what we were talking about a little bit with American Psycho. It's like, is it becoming what it parodies? Like, so it, it, I, I was going to bring up this point too because a lot of my favorite movies are uh, a commentary on, on a genre film, which then themselves become a, a a good entry into that genre. So, okay, so like. Um, Edgar Wright's real good at this. Hot Fuzz and Shaun of the Dead are right. commentaries on action movies and zombie movies, and they themselves are great action movies and zombie movies, right? Um, Galaxy Quest, right. Tim Allen yeah. vehicle from the 90s is a commentary Ooh. on sci-fi movies and is a great sci-fi movie. So like, I like movies that uh, are making a point about the genre, a genre they're in that actually become part of that genre too. And I feel like this is one of those because it does. It's almost like a, a spoof on noir of a noir uh, right. L.A. noir detective story. Yeah, basically. and then like that's, Chinatown then that's or is it, yeah. I mean, like w especially with the music in the beginning there, and like you know, Garfunkel notes girl comes over and they hook up, and then he sees Riley Coe in the in the in the pool and then she invites him in and then you know it's like this thing where like women want him all the time but then it sort of flips it where she's like no you got to get out of here actually and then it like doesn't work out and then like everything goes downhill after that we're like in another movie like classic hollywood or even like an 80s movie where this guy's just landing all these chicks left and right not really doing any doing anything remarkable but it's all working out for him and they're to me, it kind of felt like they're using that and then like flipping it and like, no, this guy's a loser. Like no one really like he, he can't pay his rent. Like no one really is interested in him. Nothing's going right for him. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. it's like, no, like noir that, detective stories, like classic noir Hollywood detective stories always have like a womanizing leading man. Right. Right. Where he's like super charming and, uh, he, you know, he's smart and he puts everything together. And this is, I guess, the Sam character is kind of taking that archetype and somewhat flipping on flipping on its head to where he's not appealing at all. He has no charm. He has no charisma. He's a right. loser. And it's it's still like set and has all the trappings of a noir detective yarn, but without like the charming leading man, like the leading man totally. is actually terrible. The, so uh, I felt, felt that all like real hardcore, especially the second time watching it through. Like he in his head thinks he's that guy right. who's like every, every woman he sees is like he's like the gift to them and can save them. And and then but like he's he's not he's like not at all. So that's right? like so like two of the biggest moments that are sort of like uh, put a button on it uh, thematically when he's standing in the office of his landlord. And he's like, who just does that? Who just moves out? And she's like, and the landlord says, you know, maybe she just doesn't like you or whatever. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then at the end, when when I he calls Sarah from the the tent to the bunker, there's a video call. I've been looking for you. Really? You don't even know me. Yeah. Or whatever yeah. she says, it's it's that you know he's um, elevated his his role on this thing. Oh gosh. Yeah. Even with Thank there's you. a scene where he's talking to I can't remember if it's Topher Grace or maybe. It's it's Jimmy Simpson. Um, and he's just like, I thought I'd just be like become important at some time, you know, at some point in my life. And I would do things oh, that yeah. people would care about, you know, and whoever it was is like, no, like, you know, so he's like living this, like, 
I'm so important every step of the way. Everything I find is just like this revelation. Which I think is a very poignant uh, idea, which I see reflected totally all the time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Is this movie about me? This movie is very uh, ego stroking in in a bunch of different ways. And I've seen, you know, the, the, uh, I've seen a level that DRM, the director that, uh, you know, this is him stroking his ego to make this movie and, and, you know, some of this putting these extra codes in and stuff. So I, I you know, it makes sense, but I also you don't want to watch it I with, mean, uh, you don't want to watch it with your parents, which is hard for us us three who worked on it that did want to show everybody yeah we can't we can't show anything to our parents um i don't know if it's appropriate to to bring this up right now but what do you what do you guys what did you guys think about the the songwriter scene like i have a hard time under i don't know maybe 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 you're not talking about this like what am i what as a viewer what am i supposed to be like is that a funny scene is this to me, it always seems like this is where things come to a head, should be coming to a head. It, it's this big, it should be this yeah. big, like, I don't know, like Club Silencio. It is Mulholland the scene of the scene. movie. You this know is, what I mean? Where it's, where it's this transportive the... thing. And it just, I, I, I don't know. I like really, I mean, listen, I went and smashed all the pixie records I have right after <laughs> a while. Um, I tore down my Black Francis poster and everything, <laughs> and, you know. Uh, but anyway, I'm really I'm just like interested uh, in the thoughts about that scene. Well, it's the it's where it raises the stakes. It's kind of the break into the third act. Yeah, right. it's when everything comes together for him. It's like when when he starts to realize all these connections are actually real and are leading somewhere. And it's just funny that they made up this guy like the. <laughs> Like the, that they go up to so his house. Mysterious. Well, well his love, house I, is like a castle on a hill when he's walking a, that's up that's to it. That's a thing. It. We almost were in charge of doing that matte painting, but mm, it right. turns out we've never done matte paintings and we're not matte painters. So we didn't really get that one. <laughs> I'm not sure. I I think we need to go back into the files and, and look which things we delivered. Because we did, we I did, mean, we did that we did one. one we did the matte painting for this, for the reservoir. We did a matte painting for that um development whatever it is yeah and we did a map painting for the underground tunnels and i it just my memory's bad it's been so long i don't remember what we turned out and i don't know if that's our stuff that's been manipulated right. somewhat from what we had or if that's our stuff or it's not our stuff at all but it's yeah. I had the same thought when I was watching it I was like wait is that I uh... yeah cuz i i did the one for i did uh, the the m- majority of the silver lake reservoir uh wide before they go swimming they're like disrobing because we had a right. little uh we had like the blue screen of them disrobing yeah. true I, I love going back to jordan's question i, I love yeah. that scene that's my favorite you oh you love that scene oh okay yeah, it's it's like so bizarre and the performance of the guy Who's clearly like made up to look yeah. super old? I love the old makeup. I yeah. love that they make him look extra old. Like, and just the the th- the way he's the way he's performing and the things he's saying and the way he's looking at him and Andrew Garfield's reaction. I think that scene really kind of hits the hits home the tone for me of it, like this dark okay. comedy almost. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. But I that is Brad. that is a pivotal moment in the film where, like, story wise, where it's like, okay, now he's gonna start to unravel these threads, and it's I'm actually gonna go somewhere. I love I love that scene so much, and his acting, uh, where he's he's talking about like, it was me you were listening to when you were rebelling, and he like holds his his hand up to his mouth like he's right. he starts playing Nirvana, <laughs> yeah, on the keys. right, right, right. Like I just that whole I. I found myself wondering, and I didn't bother to look it up, but you know, some very talented musician structured that medley, right? Of all and oh, figured yeah, it all out insane. on piano to all blend yeah. together with each other and stuff. And well, I, actually, I just, like a lot of Nirvana songs are very beautiful on piano. So. <laughs> what? Yeah, it's Did got you, like Ozzy so, Osbourne in there yeah. and the Cheers theme. The, the line we were watching the uh, like uh, between a. A blow job and a 
what does he say? <laughs> and a, like Chinese takeout or something. Yeah, yeah. They, uh, we were watching the credits and then there's like, you know, like three screens full of like music that's been licensed. And we're yeah. like, what? Oh, because of that one scene. Yeah, yeah, I think it's like right. 40 songs or something. And it was like half the budget. <laughs> goes it must have been. It must have been huge. <laughs> I, but to, I, to keep that on streaming too must cost a lot of money with all that. Yeah, music, right. I fucking just love that, that scene. scene too brad i there is something it's so bizarre i that character is so mysterious to me i want to know so much more about him but well, I don't you're not actually. gonna know because he got yeah. his head bashed in violently like i, I would love, love like, i love uh, the head bashing uh, in it's HBO so ridiculous it's, it's so like romero yeah it's yeah. so like romero the 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 fake head just caves right in and is full of nothing but blood yeah. there's no skull there's no brain there's no <laughs> eyes it's just a bowl <laughs> did you guys look up who that sucks. actor is I looked him up. Yeah, isn't he in a... Yeah, he's in a bunch of stuff. His name's uh, Jeremy Bob. Yeah. And he's yeah, in... Uh, I looked him HBO, up. The Outsider. He's in Russian Doll. On, on yeah, Russian uh, Doll. I saw, yeah. That's what I was going to say. He's like a... Sure, going, okay. Uh, so, but yeah, you know, you, you see oh, it's like, right. okay, this is a guy... Yeah, yeah, they, yeah, yeah. He looks this is a like guy they made to look old. And, because well, like... Well, I'm jealous. I'm jealous. Uh, I wish I had love for the, I mean I, I like it in a vacuum I guess for this movie for me I'm I'm waiting for it to build build to this like this transportive scene come to a head right it just never quite I, gets and it, there. that's I, the I, scene though I think well, that's... no I exactly why I asked about it because I feel like that's the scene where it's supposed to happen and I like the scene but it just doesn't do it for me like emotionally uh, so I, I've got I've got some ideas, <laughs> and maybe <laughs> maybe it's just not what I want it to be. Like what I want it to be is not what it's supposed to be. I think is the what what really is going on. I feel like what we're seeing, which we see a few times in this movie, is someone uh, looks up to again always up. He idolizes these musicians who it turns out they didn't write their stuff. So there's a, a level. Okay, there's some higher power controlling the musicians. Who's that? Next level up. The creator goes to see the creator. What's the creator say? He says, like, I'm like you. I just work. I don't mm. like it. Like he's mm. not an ascended being and he's not you know, necessarily happy about it. He's like, I, I, have, I made all these songs, you know? Yes, but I'm not like on this higher level of understanding. Right, I just like pass you, the message. Yeah, like you think I am, right? And so then he reacts in his deranged Jekyll and Hyde way. But though in this case, it's a little bit justified. He's being shot at, but he kills the creator, right? Killing yeah. basically again a god from his perspective, right? right? Because he idolizes these musicians. He's basically killing a god, making him the god dog killer question mark put a pin in it string some red yarn around that pin and then we'll see where it connects <laughs> okay silva uh yeah i i do think that this is definitely a movie you have to you can't base your judgment off of one viewing it's it, it's tough it needs it's, to be it's studied. a hard it's hard to get there i feel like it's uh it's a little bit long so I hate to say that, but it's it's just a long time to sit there if you watch it straight through. You know what I mean? Just like physically a little bit long. But then from Without a movie- Without giving you like big payoffs of like understanding or like emotional payoffs. Well, that's did what I was Did you look say. at your phone? How many times did you look at your phone, Gus? Just straight you up. You know what? I was really good. I did eat in like almost an entire bag of uh, smart food white cheddar popcorn yeah i had to watch it in bits you know i had to so i was going to say though there's like certain movies that um that you leave like air punching and so hyped yeah and like you just immediately like that was such an awesome ride it's like the feeling of getting off a roller coaster or whatever um this is neither of those things, but it it's like a brain worm that you just sit on for a long time. You think about it for a long time. Things oh yeah, it just didn't, this movie doesn't leave like 
I think about this movie from not only because we worked on it, but like uh, literally the plot of the movie and like how it's yeah. I well, that it. goes so, back to like something I bring up a lot. I'm glad that movies like this exist because if you see a movie that's this divisive with critics and audiences, you know it's going to be interesting. You see a lot of movies, it's like, all right, that was cool, but it doesn't stay with you. Like you, yeah, you forget about it 10 minutes later. This is not that movie. This is not a movie that you cheer at the end, but it's a movie you think about well into the next day. And uh, like, if this is a director doing his thing and putting putting things out there, and you know, I'm glad, (laughs) well, I'm glad this movie exists. Yeah, it's, I don't. Right. That's like a glowing review of it, but I, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I like one of a million movies like this. It's way more interesting than you know the the fifty thousandth superhero movie. The last movie that tickled my brain the same way that this movie tickled my yeah. brain is The Lighthouse, and I laid yeah. awake oh, yeah. for nights trying to make the connections and figure it out. And Love I think the that the the difference between the lighthouse and this is the lighthouse is built upon the foundation of mythology that I don't know about. So like I'm, I, after reading and researching and stuff, it's like, Oh, this is based on this myth, which I was unaware of, but now it starts to make sense in the language of the film or in the fiction of the film, it starts to make sense because I learned about this myth, but this movie isn't based on anything quite so esoteric that you need to like have a degree to know about it's just based on like pop culture like dumb stuff so it's more accessible in that way but it's got a similar level of like puzzle solving and you know deeper thinking and whatever (laughs) well brad should we uh do our classic uh what have we been watching segment all right time for a segment we call what are you watching this is where we just briefly describe something we've watched in the last week, and do we recommend it or not? I uh, mm-hmm. I watched a bunch of really shitty movies this week. <laughs> there was a movie. There's a movie called Bliss with uh, Luke Wilson and uh, Salma Hayek, which is just terrible. Skip that one. Oh yeah, the Amazon original it sucked. <laughs> I, I watched the second Babysitter movie. Remember oh yeah yeah one? i uh, was Coffee, talking about the first Coffee one recommended that one to me i haven't watched the second one yet but it's sitting there on, on my queue waiting for me on netflix the yet. second one is just hot 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 steaming garbage <laughs> it is it is like i'm still trying to figure out if it's bad enough to be funny like the dialogue and the way that the characters act there's some good gore in it it has a couple good kills but oh my god, the dialogue is so bad. It is so bad. Every character is so snarky, and there's always a pop culture reference. Like everybody, even like the cop that shows up to investigate, drops like a vanilla ice reference. I, picture like me, this tragically unhip fifty-year-old, writing and directing a movie where I'm trying to be cool with the kids, and I'm, I'm, and I'm right, I'm writing all these lines like. I'm going to slide into your DMs. <laughs> I'm with you so far. I don't know what's wrong here. <laughs> well, yeah. Kelfie, check it out. Let me know if you think oh, I will. it's bad I will. enough I, to be funny. It's just I so... can't be deterred. I only watch really bad stuff. So The first movie was decent, right? I mean... Yeah, and it was fun. Yeah. Second movie's not, <laughs> not decent. <laughs> it's hot garbage. But check it out because it's got some dialogue in it that's trying so hard to be hip and funny but actually just comes off as sad (laughs) so anyway i watched um jordan uh, you might be on the same page with me here on this one did you did you watch the first episode of uh, falcon and the winter soldier no not yet i'm not terribly interested oh you are uh, i you know i enjoyed wandavision for the first bit before it became a superhero (laughs) show Show. Yeah, I feel the same way. I was so pissed about that. This starts off straight superhero stuff, and they must have spent. I was joking with Alex that they're not going to have another fight scene for like five episodes because the amount of right like energy right. and money and time they put into it. Um, we'd struggled through the first episode, and then 
maybe 15 minutes in, Alex is like, ah, oh, the show. And I paused it to see how much longer. And it was like, you know, like an hour left or something. Uh, so uh, I unfortunately, don't know. yeah. Right. Jordan, um, you're next. Jordan, what have you been watching? Yeah. So, uh, you know, we've, my, you know, uh, my partner and I have been bouncing between a few shows lately. So we got, uh, for all mankind on apple tv plus i know yeah ah. uh, like an alternate reality space show where the russians got to the moon first it's got like uh, uh joel Kin- Kin- kinnaman from the killing and i think he's in the yeah yeah, yeah yeah he's good Yo Suicide Squad. Yo, Yo 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 very, yeah yeah um, Yo <laughs> and um it's got the the guy from patriot the, the main guy from patriot amazon now canceled pa- the, the patriot Ugh. Patriot favorite show ever. Uh, surprisingly, Mel Gibson. Good. I, I've been enjoying <laughs> it. Uh, the like effects are are pretty well done when they're on they're on the moon quite a bit. We have like a base on the moon in this alternate history and stuff. Yeah. Cool. Well, all right, okay. Adam. And, you know, what are you watching? <laughs> all eyes on me, guys. I didn't know we were going to do this segment because I haven't listened long enough in any of the episodes to realize that there's a segment at the end. So. <laughs> It might be the best it's segment that, on that, that the it, podcast it, has. Yeah. So, so can I recommend to you guys a little show from the early 2000s called Gilmore Girls? <laughs> I have watched <laughs> seven seasons of this thing in the last two months like crazy. Uh, but, but seriously, though, folks, uh, I did watch a movie that I can put a recommendation on. Uh, Netflix original called uh, His House. Have we, have we watched this yet? Horror movie? Uh-uh. No. It's got uh, oh, it's got the dude who played one of the Doctor Who's. Uh, oh, Matt Smith is in it, and then the rest of the cast's names I can't, I, I hesitate to even try to pronounce because they're all like um, African names that have versions of letters that have symbols above them that I don't even know in what way those symbols are supposed to alter the sounds okay, okay. and I'm not even going to attempt it but it's this really c- cool horror movie about um refugees from oh, I saw the Africa for this. I didn't know it was out. They're resettled in London in this really run down tenement and then it's sort of like a, a haunted house movie sort of uh, rolls out there. but they're like stuck the, there the stakes are cool because they're 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 in this situation where they're not allowed to cause a ruckus or leave the house or upset anything or they'll be sent back right they have to just be good and be happy or else they'll get sent back and so then how do they deal with this haunted house situation you know under those guidelines so it's it's very cool uh, for its social commentary, it's actually a good horror movie, and it's interesting and cool to me because it's a PG thirteen that feels scarier than most R rated horror movies. Yeah. So like, I like that about it. Oh it man, I'm so pumped! I saw that trailer. It looked great. It sounds good. It's, it is very good. And the the one nitpick, if I'm gonna have a nitpick, is I, I'm tired of. There's two genres of film that lean too heavily on whatever the thing is that's happening in the movie is an allegory for grief. And those two genres are horror movies and animated kids films. <laughs> it's always about <laughs> some parent died and we're gonna learn to deal with our feelings, right? Well, that, or, that's every well, animated film. It's every animated film and it's every horror movie. I mean, so like, I, I got a, a bug up my butt about any time that's what the allegory is. And there's a little bit of that in this because they're sort of remembering the hardships that you know brought them to this point and, and dealing with those in the hauntings. Hell yeah, I'm watching that shit. Well, guys, that was fun. We did these, it. We did these a guys, thing. man. We'll do. Let's do a little outro. This was great. This was a good episode. It was great. I it can was feel great it. to be on. It was. Yeah, we we'll, to do this every week. We'll have you on again for sure. Yeah, we're good doing luck. it every. We've been doing it every week. And good luck editing this one. I'm sure there's a lot of crosstalk. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Yeah, this one. Anytime there's a guest on, I found the edit is quite, uh, quite a chore. But I enjoy editing. So, well, guys. All right. This more frames. Absolute pleasure. More frames. Animation. Gus Trout, Adam Kelp, Jordan Held. Thank you for joining us. It's been great. We'll have you back on for sure.